Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of What's the Message? I am your host, Claudia Allen, and this podcast, as you all know, is hosted and sponsored by Message Magazine, whose editor is the one and only Carmela Monk Crawford. Now, this week, we are unable to bring you in a, a, a brand new episode. Our leaders are currently in their year end meetings and we are having some very important conversations that have everything to do with you, this podcast, and how we move forward in the upcoming year. And so we are so excited to continue to bring you brand new content. And so the thing that we need you to do is we need you to support. Make sure if you haven't already, donate at www.messagemagazine.com. Text us and give what you have available to 41444. Text message mag to 41444 and donate. But even beyond that, we want you to actually get our print magazine. There is so much content in the print issue that we just intentionally don't put online because we know how important it is, we know how amazing it is, and we want you to get an exclusive. So make sure that you visit our website at www.messagemagazine.com and get your issue of the print magazine. now. That said, we here at Message believe that it is so critically important that given the fact that this is less than a week before um, election day, we think it is so important that we encourage all of you to make sure that your voice is heard and that your vote is counted. So make sure that you vote. If you haven't already mailed in your ballot, make sure to take your drop um, your mail-in ballot to a drop box. I did that this week. Um, this week, Tuesday, yesterday actually, yesterday morning I went to a drop box, put it right in there, and this morning um, the election board sent me an email saying that they got my vote and they've counted it. So this is the time. I know we always say that November 3rd is election day, but the election has been going on. We are voting. And so we want to encourage you to continue to do just that. Voting is so much more important than just electing a president. But we are voting for our local judges. We are voting on state and county budgets. We are voting on whether or not our communities get the resources that they need. And so it is so critical that you vote. And so because of that, we want to encourage you to tune in to this episode. We had one of the most powerful, inspiring episodes about voting with uh, Orlin Johnson, uh, Deborah Anderson, and Simone and Garrison Hayes. And I just want to reiterate this episode. We want to put this episode back out here because in case you missed it, we want to really drive home the importance of voting. Check it out. And welcome to another episode of What's the Message? I am your host, Claudia Allen, and it is an, uh, an, an, an exciting time here on What's the Message? Because we are going to have our own little MSNBC conversation about politics this morning. And I have some amazing guests that are going to help me do that. Now, as many of you know, this week was the Democratic National Convention. And for the past three nights, we've been reminded of the diversity within our 50 states, the importance of this particular election, and the power of we the people. Today, we have a stellar panel with us that is going to dialogue about the past few days and help us understand what happened and how move forward in preparation for November. But of course, I am here with my co-host, my boss, the lady in chief, the editor in chief, the commander in chief, Carmela mm. Monk Crawford. I can't do any of this without my partner in crime. 
And so it is exciting to have her here with me alongside me. So let's go ahead and get into these introductions because I am so excited to let you know who we have. First, we have the amazing, beautiful Deborah Crable Anderson. She is an experienced public speaker whose talents have been recognized by some of the nation's well-known broadcasting companies. Her professional background includes a 20-year career in radio and television and 15 years of executive communications on Capitol Hill, right where she served as Deputy Chief of Staff and Communications Director for the 2nd Congressional District of Pennsylvania. Deborah's career began at KQV All News Radio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. She has worked as a radio news anchor and talk show host and as a television news analyst in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Subsequently, she worked as the evening anchor at the all news radio station WTOP in Washington, DC. Now, when the family moved to Okinawa, Japan, Deborah's thirst for media and news was met with an offer to host a public affairs show on the Armed Forces Radio and Television Network, a position she held during their three-year stay on the island. When the family returned to the United States, she was recruited back to anchor the desk at WTOP. Currently, Deborah serves as assistant to the president for communication at the Potomac Conference Corporation of Seventh-day Adventists. She resides in Bowie, Maryland with her husband, Paul, and they have two adult children and four grandchildren. Deborah anchors her life and her favorite text with Jeremiah 29 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Next up, we have the dynamic Orlin Johnson, who is the Director of Public Affairs and Religious Liberty for the North American Division of the Sunday Adventist Church, where he directs the division's outreach in the area of religious liberty for all people, interacts with public officials, and represents the church's viewpoint on policymakers in both the public and private sectors. Mr. Johnson has practiced law for over 25 years and has been blessed to serve in numerous positions in both the public and private sectors. Mr. Johnson is a former senior partner and member of Saul Ewing's business and finance department, where he was co-chair of the Securities Transactions and Regulations Practice Group and chairman of the firm's diversity committee. His practice focused on general corporate matters, complex business transitions, and federal and state regulatory issues in business and securities transactions. Now, prior to working at Saul Ewing, Mr. Johnson was of counsel to the law firm of Milbank, Tweed, Hadley, and McCloy, where he was co-head of the regulatory practice in the Washington, D.C. office of his 600 attorney Wall Street-based international law firm. After serving as one of the original members of Senator Barack Obama's National Finance Committee in 2009, Mr. Johnson was appointed by President Obama and confirmed by the United States Senate to be chairman of the Securities Investor Protection Corporation, the lead organization responsible for the investigation and recovery process for account holders of failed brokerage firms such as Lehman, Madoff, and MF Global. Under Chairman Johnson, the, F the SIPC recovered the single largest asset forfeiture in United States history of $7.2 billion. He is married to Zena Johnson, a gospel musician, and has three children, a recent law school grad, and currently a PhD candidate at Harvard Law School. Oh yeah, at Harvard. Adam, a 2018 graduate of Oakland University and self-employed entrepreneur living in Huntsville, Alabama, and Jair, a rising fourth year student at Oakwood University. Next, we have Garrison Hayes. Garrison Hayes holds an undergraduate degree in film production and completed a Master of Divinity from the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary in 2018. Informed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, Garrison has an abiding commitment to the work of diversity and inclusion in higher education and society. Hayes has served as a trusted partner in racial justice initiatives and strategic planning 
consulting and or training at institutions like Georgetown University School of Medicine, Andrews University, Southern Adventist University, Fuller Theological Seminary, and numerous other educational and religious institutions. In the summer of 2020, Garrison and his wife Simone founded Impact Democracy, an initiative to spark a movement of voter accountability and partnership. He is an Atlanta Georgia native currently living in Alexandria, Virginia with his wife Simone, and there Garrison serves as the pastor for generational ministries at the Community Praise Seventh-day Adventist Church. Now next up, we have the beautiful, intelligent Simone Marshall Hayes, the wife of the young man I just introduced. <laughs> Simone was raised in Nashville, Tennessee, but her roots are on the beautiful island of Barbados and Grenada. Ever since she can remember, she has been passionate about voting, but during law school and be at Belmont University College of Law, her passion for voting grew even more as she learned about voter discrimination and realized how many violent crimes and unjust barriers had been mercilessly, mercilessly thrusted upon Black people just because someone didn't want them to vote. Earlier in summer of 2020, she and her husband Garrison created Impact Democracy, a voter accountability partnership to encourage their friends to vote. Those friends, they encourage their friends to vote. And their goal is very simple, to educate people about the value of their vote, the history of their vote, and how to vote. I am so excited to have all of these panelists. Carmela, take it away. What are we talking about? Help us understand what are the headlines? Oh my goodness, Claudia, what a setup and what a distinguished panel of guests. They're going to school us today because I need schooling. As I've been watching the, the uh, convention speeches and, and I have to say, this has been for me one of the most exciting conventions to watch mm. simply because it feels so organic, simply because we're looking at people in their living rooms from all walks of life all around the country talking about their needs and talking about their hopes for the government. And the one thing that I want to know, and I want to ask you right off the bat, and I might be tossing this to Orlin Johnson, I'm not sure, and or uh, Deborah Crable Anderson. It's so, I can't wait to hear the voice. Deborah's voice <laughs> is the one we got to listen for. But Bernie Sanders said, and I'm going to him not because he's my candidate or anything like this, but he said the other day what I thought was a, 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 an interesting kind of thing for uh, a politician to say, who people who've seen this, seen this cycle come around every four years, every two years, uh, you know, an older gentleman, <laughs> Bernie Sanders says, this is not just the election about your town, your state, the country, this is the planet. And so I'm asking you, is it all that? Is this truly different this time? What do you think, Orlin Johnson? No, I think it is different this time. And I think the reason that it is different is because uh, the United States has turned into a very different place. I think when you understand that being president of the United States is also comes with the title of being the leader of the free world, um, when leadership is responsible to be seen across the globe or around the planet, and when your partners don't feel like that leadership is there, I think it does require that all of us look at this from a global perspective. You know, I remember when Barack Obama was elected president, when they were showing clips of his you know, victory speech. And there were people all around the world that were sitting around in different places that were actually being, you know, happy and taking pictures and thinking about where the future was gonna be. But I think you'd have to be living under a rock to not realize that this is an inflection point in the United States. When you start to see what's going on in terms of racial issues, when you see the question of empathy or the lack thereof, when you see over 100,000 people have died from a pandemic in the United States, and, and you contrast that to a place like South Korea, where less than 300 people have died. I mean, you can't help but to think something big is going on in the United States and how it impacts the world and the globe and the planet, I think is for real. You think he's right. What about you? What's your take on that Deborah Anderson, welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you. I agree with Orlin. Um, to say that this election is actually about the soul of this country is not an understatement. It will define who we are as not just individually as people, but as a country collectively. What do we want? What are our values? Where do we want to be? What do we want to do? Who is our neighbor? Who do we care about? Families? The unborn? Mm -hmm. Children? The sick? What are our core values? And this election will tell us who America is. Now, you know, I, I was, admittedly, I was naive in 2016. I was. I thought that, you know, we were going to continue on a, a path where democracy was honored and celebrated. I could not have been more wrong or more disappointed, but we have a chance for a do-over. And it is my prayer. It is my hope. I can't, I can't even think, I can't Im imagine waking up knowing on November 4th that our country will continue um, down the path that it is. Um, and this is not partisan. This is practical. Mm. This is putting your feet to the fire and actually doing what has to be done to ensure that your children, my grandchildren in this case, are going to be able to live, survive, and be celebrated um, in ways that they have been before and even looking towards the future in better ways, that they will be counted, that their lives will matter, that there will be somebody there to protect them. Mm -hmm. The soul of the country is at stake. And I just pray that everybody actually recognizes and honors that. You know, I'm going to uh, pass the question on to this lovely couple, the Hazes as well, but with a slightly different bent. I, I, I want to know what your thought is as we come to this moment. And I guess I'm coming to you with the assumption that you still think because you were involved in voting efforts and you, the programs that you are working with, I'm coming with you to you with the assumption that you still think that the voting matters and it's going to make a difference um, in this time. Talk to me about where we are. Yeah, yeah, we do believe that firmly. Um, I think there are so many people working to prevent um, particularly Black people from voting. There are so many efforts designed to stop us from voting that it's hard for me to avoid the conclusion that voting clearly matters. And I think this moment is representative of that. I, Michelle Obama, both, you know, former vice, uh, former first lady Michelle Obama and former president uh, Barack Obama gave incredible speeches over the last couple of days. But um, in Michelle Obama's statement, she, she noted that in Michigan, um, it averaged, the, the difference averaged out to about two votes per precinct uh, that led to Donald Trump winning the state of Michigan. If we really consider the fact that just two, if just two people per precinct showed up, we would be living in totally different times. It's mind blowing. And, and you know, we're led to believe that our vote, that one vote is just whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, but that statistic, that information that she, she put out there to the American people uh, really is, I think, a paradigm shift, I hope, for someone. I hope that it, it gives someone the, the information that they need to make a wise decision which is a part of the reason why we're working so hard to, to get our friends to, to have accountability partners who have accountability partners, because those two votes could be any of us. You know, mm -hmm. it could be anyone who just decided it's not worth it. Um, just as, as former President Barack Obama said last night, we have the opportunity to decide whether or not we want to renew the contract for this president. And, and I think that those watching and so many around our nation have decided, I don't want to renew that contract. And in order to do so, you've got to get out there and vote. Yeah, I think that we really um, underestimated the power of not voting hmm. in 2016. I think that we just took it all like, oh, 
you know, it's going to be, it's going to go in a certain direction. And I, and I think that that direction felt sure because we thought that there was a clear path to political accountability, if nothing else, even if you didn't agree with every single thing that was coming out of certain parties' mouths, you knew that, okay, there's one person who is going to be accountable to checks and balances. And as we've seen over the last four years, there's another person who has tried to make every branch of government his branch of government and has tried to form it all to his benefit. And so when we're talking about voting, um, it actually is more than just about the presidential vote. It's, it's about voting for legislators. It's about voting for local judges, local DAs who are making these decisions. And of course, it's crucial in a presidential election for everybody to get out there and vote and to not view themselves as, as being able to abstain this time, because we saw what that got us in 2016. Um, and, and I think that if people were more accountable to each other and formed kind of like this dialogue of, of are you voting? Okay, I'm voting. Let's go. Mm -hmm. Like, let's go to the polls and social distance together. I think that if we had those moments, if we had the deadlines on our social media so that I, our friends could see, I think that people would be more inclined to, to, you know, depart from their busy schedules and to get engaged in this very, very significant um, political process that, as Garrison mentioned, people have literally died because of the right to vote. When you look at so many of the hate crimes that happened in the South, there are tons of lynchings and, and people's houses being bombed. And why? When you look at it, those are poll workers. Those mm -hmm. are people who are dedicating themselves to signing up Black people to vote. And, and local people did not appreciate it. And so they targeted them. Um, and so, you know, it's so much more than skin color. It's so much more than, than political affiliation. It's about using your voice to have an impact. We, this is all so good, guys. Um, I really appreciate what you were saying as well, Simone, and talking about how this is actually more than just the presidential election, but this is also Senate. This is also Congress. This is also judges. I noticed during the Democratic National Convention that we were even talking about this, right? So people would say, hey, we have the power to flip the Senate or, um, you know, we're, we're trying to do more than just elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Why is that going on? Orland, help me understand what is the purpose of the Democratic National Convention and what should viewers and voters be looking for when watching this event? Well, I think the primary purpose has been for a very long time this is an opportunity to get the whole nation to see what a party is all about. Mm. I mean, the reality is, is that most individuals don't sit around thinking about political parties on a regular basis. Mm. And one of the things that these conventions do, they usually like to show you who are the stars in our party that you don't know about. Who are the people at the state level? You know, who are the people, you know, that are at county level? You know, all of these levels to show that you've got a bench to be able to demonstrate that you not only are good for right now, but you'll be good for the future. So the whole idea was really let the nation know who we are as a party, let them know what our planks are, let them know what we believe. And that will probably be able to give them a better handle on what's going on. You know, what I found really intriguing is obviously I've been to a few Democratic conventions, I've been to a few Republican conventions. And to be able to see the contrast now you know, I was just telling my wife last night, this like felt more like the Grammy Awards than the DNC, you know? I mean, you got all this new feel, people singing like videos, you know? I, you know, and maybe I'm just too old to completely get it all, but I like the idea of showing people who you are. And to me, that's the purpose of the convention. And you hope that normally it will give you a bit of what they would call a bounce in the polls, because now folk are thinking about you a little bit differently. But with this whole new platform, I have no idea what the bounce is expected to be. Or do you get the bounce? Or who's paying attention and who's not? But that's usually what it's been all about. You know, you want to build up, build up, build up, and then you bring in your candidate and hopefully they come in and seal the deal. And that's usually the purposes of all these conventions. And you know, I think it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out because, you know, Joe Biden has run for president a whole bunch of times, but people forget Ronald Reagan ran for president three times. 
So mm-hmm. the fact of the matter is, is just the fact that you run a lot doesn't mean anything. But the reality is, is that if you can tell your story at the right time, under the right set of circumstances, and feel where the country wants to go, I think that's what this is really all about. And that's what you hope your convention is doing, is tapping into the pulse of America where it is at that moment. Yeah, Deborah, you have um, also actually been to a DNC and have worked a DNC. Could you tell us about that experience and how you even got to do that? Sure. It was probably, you know, when you rank um, experiences, if you give them a, a ranking of like one to 10, that one was probably number four. It was one of the best um, events of my life, it, one of experiences of my life. Um, the one I, last one I went to was 2016 and uh, how I got there. Um, at the time I was still working on Capitol Hill and of course, you know, it's politics. So right time, right place, right people, it all kind of converges. And um, they were looking for people that would help in the press office. So that's my area of expertise. Um, and so I, along with my sister actually, worked in a different department. Um, we went and spent four of the best days of our life there. And why? Because I felt like I was part of a process to help move the country forward, to deliver a message about, help to deliver the message about what the platform was all about, about where we were heading as a country or hoped to head as a country. And it was um, a lot of work, a lot of long hours, but again, one of the most rewarding experiences. And one of the things I learned um, during that time was the collective energy of the people that Orlin was talking about propels them to go back and multiply that energy locally. And so energy, positive energy propels positive energy. And when I came back from that convention, which was in August, August to November, I just did whatever I could do and encouraged people to do whatever they could do for whatever candidate. Because while I have my own particular um, political party that I'm affiliated with, I believe that people in general should exercise their right to vote should exercise their political leanings, however they feel those leanings should be. If they align with mine, that's perfect. However, (laughs) you know, that's not gonna happen, but everybody should be part of the political process and teach their children to be part of the political process. Because at some point they're gonna turn 18, they're gonna be able to vote and their vote is going to count, it's gonna matter. That's awesome. Guys, this is such a an, an important conversation. So we want to make sure that you share this on your platforms right now. Click that share button um, so that everybody can get into this conversation about the soul of our nation. Carmela. I was just going to say, based on what you all are saying, and anybody can jump in here. As I'm watching this convention, and maybe Orlin alluded to this a moment ago, that yes, it is the opportunity of the party to relay to the uh, potential voters, the voter base, um, what the, the platform is, what the different planks are. But as I listen to the speeches, to me, it seems as though the number one plank, the all encompassing plank is character. Hmm. As you look at ev- what everyone is saying, even you know your, your policies may differ and, and we, we've gotten to know these different candidates, but from Michelle Obama to Barack Obama, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, all the way through, character is what has been on the table. What do you think about my assessment? Do you think that that was um, inadvertent? Do you think that was a failure? Or do you think that's what the central issue is? Well, from my perspective, I think that was always the central issue in a campaign and <laughs> when you're looking for somebody. And I think The idea of who you are as a person, what you stand for, that was always just taken for granted. You know, the idea that our leader would be always in support of democracy, that was just taken for granted. You know, the idea that maybe you really loved your family and loved other people, that was taken for granted. 
And when you start to see the nation evolve in a direction where it doesn't it comport to what you believe you want to be or what you would hope to be, every now and then you've got to remind people, this is what this is really all about. You know, yeah. listen, when Barack Obama was elected president of the United States, he was probably as different from George Bush as anything that you could imagine. I mean, the country decided to do something wild almost, mm -hmm. but it worked out. But every now and then when you pull that wild card out, sometimes it doesn't work out. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, people talk about the Trump presidency. It's not the first time America has had a president that was a little bit on the edge, but I actually am one of those people who believe in the American people. I believe that they make decisions at times because of what they believe they need. But I also believe that that same group who made Barack Obama president, that made Donald Trump president, would be willing to turn based on what is going on in their life on any particular moment. And I think that does make a difference. And so this idea of character, sometimes you have to remind people, you know what, character actually matters, you know? And sometimes people start taking for granted, you know, every now and then you want a president that you think you can sit down and have dinner with. And then depending on what the world is like, you want a president who won't sit down and have dinner with me. He's not like me. He's not my friend. The guys I hang out with, I don't want that type to be president. So depending on what's going on in the world, I think that's what's happening. And this year, I think the remembrance of character counts is a big part of what's happening. Hmm. Man, Carmela, I really appreciate that question. You know, I'm wondering, uh, you know, this is to anybody on the panel, you know, Michelle Obama absolutely stole night one, right? So we watched her steal night one. And she said, quote, this is not the time to withhold our votes in protest or play games with candidates who have no chance of winning. Now, hmm. what do you feel like Auntie Michelle was referring to or <laughs> trying to say. Now, is she trying to guilt us into voting for Joe? What What is Michelle talking about when she says that? Yeah, I, I think I think she's talking about, you know, obviously what happened in 2016. There were a number of people who voted for Gary Johnson and other third party candidates out of a sense of protest, knowing that they'd never have an opportunity to win. So I think that phenomenon exists and it exists in almost every national election. But beyond that, I think, you know, there is a, a, a growing conversation about, specifically within our community, about people like Kanye West, who's running for president, um, and mm. the idea that, that maybe people will vote for him or think he will be better than, than either of the two, you know, larger party candidates, which is insane. I, I just want to say that on the record, that's crazy talk. <laughs> Uh, but beyond that, I also think that, you know, speaking, you know, uh, more politically to the Democratic Party, I think she's speaking to the progressive wing of the party. Uh, there is obviously a bit of disappointment amongst some progressives that um, a Bernie Sanders or even a, an Elizabeth Warren um, hasn't, you know, advanced and, and, and didn't, you know, main, make up enough momentum to become the candidate. And I think that there are those individuals who would like to kind of equivocate, who would like to say that oh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are, are maybe the same in some way or another, and therefore I'm just gonna opt out and vote for the person who I want, which would probably be maybe a Bernie Sanders in that instance. And I, I think she's just speaking directly to this idea of political change theory. I, honestly, I, I don't know if people have a, a clear understanding at times of the way the political process works the fact that you have to participate in the process and do the things like like what what um, you know Mrs. Anderson had to say about getting out there and organizing in your your community and, and, and leveraging that momentum to make a difference locally, so that your candidate, so that your people can eventually take national take the national stage. I think it's important for for progressives especially. I've seen this a lot on Facebook it's really important for us to, to understand the political process in this moment, to understand what's at stake and to avoid the mistake of trying to champion some, some cause to the detriment, not only of ourselves, but of those people on the border, of those single mothers, of those individuals who are facing you know, loss because of this pandemic, because we wanted to stand on some principled ground 
that led to an individual like Donald Trump being in the White House making decisions that has led to at least 170,000 people dead. Yeah. Yes. Talk to me about balancing your conscience in this, in this, when you're in the voting booth, you're looking uh, from the top all the way down to the ticket, uh, to the bottom of the ticket. Talk to me about some of the issues that you should carry in on your heart and your mind as a citizen who's informed by biblical principles out there. Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, I think that one thing you have to keep in mind is that it's a long game. If it's a four year term that we're looking at. So people are kind of, some people are thinking kind of to Garrison's point, is they're thinking about, okay, uh, what's my ideal candidate? How can I get them in office? Okay, but right now we have to make a decision for the next four years. And so walking into the booth, you have to kind of keep that in mind. Who's gonna listen to me? Who's gonna care about the things that I'm saying? Who is going to treat people um, even as Christians, who's going to treat people justly, you know, who's going to uh, treat them with mercy, who's going to, you know, act with humility and listen to everyday Americans and, and care about those issues and, and care about small businesses and, and, and just really delve into some of those problems. I think that even taps back into character, you know, are we dealing with a person who is willing to listen and, and therefore we can maybe push the needle on some issues and we can we can get them to kind of, okay, you're, you're here, let's get you here. Um, and, and that idea of being able to work with someone over the course of time is so important to us to take that mindset into the booth when we're thinking about who to vote for. Um, if we're thinking, okay, I'm gonna vote for this third party person or I'm gonna vote for this, you know, they're not gonna win. And so at the end of the day, that that's not a, that's a short term game. And so we have to think more long term. We have to evaluate what's at stake and see how we can be strategic in out in achieving our goals. That's really good, guys. You know, oh, go ahead, Miss Deborah. <laughs> you know, this, this might sound over simplistic or over dramatic, but before you go into the booth, and it might sound elementary, do your homework. Do not go into the booth saying, okay there's a D or there's an R, let me vote this, or let me vote that, do your homework. You mm. do yourself and your community a disservice. When you go in there willy-nilly and just have one, the, the, perhaps the presidential um, race in mind and you guess at everything else, you could be voting for somebody for sheriff or DA that absolutely has, does not have your best interest at heart. And think about it, take a, take a legal path, write mm -hmm. down there what your core values are. I care, what is important to me? I care about people. I wanna make sure everybody has health care. I want to make sure that when I come, comes time for me to retire that I have social security benefits or those who have gone before me have worked and put into the system that they have that, that they can recoup what they have already invested. That, um, you know, we care about housing, we care uh, you, just about a, an array of things. What do you care about? And then marry that with the candidate that both most and best resembles your core values. Uh, you didn't ask me this, but I want to hear. One of the things that just drives me crazy is the willful ignorance that we can sometimes exercise when we go into the booth, not knowing, not understanding, not taking the time to invest in our future, because that's what we're doing. When we don't do our research, we are saying, okay, the heck with it, I'll just pick a name. And that is so infuriating to me because so many people work so hard to ensure that the best candidates are running. And there are people out there that just, just dismiss it. Um, so, and can I say this one thing to Garrison? You said that Kanye was running for president. No, he's not. He is running to disrupt the presidential mm. race. And that's a big difference. And he's admitted it. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'm finished. <laughs> no, no, that's good. I, I really actually even want to ask a follow-up question to you, Miss Deborah. Like, how can I educate myself? How can I learn about these different candidates that are going for um, all these different positions, whether that's sheriff or DA or, or what have you? Where can I get that information from? You know, 
when I was growing up, you know, my mother used to say that and I couldn't stand that term. But now that I'm this age, I can say when I was growing up, you know, mm -hmm. um, I depended on the encyclopedia and those kinds of things. But now Google is a wonderful instrument. It is a wonderful instrument right there at your fingertips. Mm -hmm. Do that. Let me just say that in the primary, I live in Prince George's County, Maryland. And so in the last primary, when we were all mailed our ballots, um, and they had a number of people, you know, signs all over the road about people who were running for judge and people who were doing this. And I looked at one of the signs for one of the judges and I said, oh, wow, she looks familiar. I think I know her. I'll vote for her. And then I said, mm, breaks. Just be sure. Did, mm -hmm. Went and did some research and found out there was a slate of five judges that were being pushed by um a certain segment and then there were the others well mm -hmm. upon further research because i sat down and said don't be that person that you hate um i went and did all the research and found out that the slate of five so there were five judges that could be elected the slate of five judges they mm -hmm. were um being pushed as a group for a reason and the reasons were their experience their background how they voted on the issues these other two candidates who happened to be African-American women, which drew me to them and thought, okay, good, let's get some more women in here. But in further investigation, I found out mm -mm, they purposely did not participate or one of them purposely did not participate in any debates, mm -hmm. um, had run several times with failed um, campaigns because she didn't do the work. She mm -hmm. didn't do the work. Mm -hmm. So research, you can find out, do um, Google, look at the articles, research their name, find out what they've been doing um, mm -hmm. or not doing. It really won't take you that much time. That's just a good point that you're making because that sort of echoes something that Simone was saying. I mean, we're doing the long game. We're looking for people who are playing the game strategically and doing it well so that we are not throwing away our votes. You know, and so it is so important to do that research. I think the um, one of our uh, one of the people who are watching right now online uh, is talking about going to community events and meetings so that you can see where people stand. You can see what is being discussed and participate in the process. I mean, because you know, election is just one part of our our, our civic engagement. But being at those school board meetings, being at the zoning and the planning commission being at uh, a lot of these boring things that we used to cover as journalists <laughs> that you know fortunately we don't have to do that much anymore but being there seeing how things happen at the grassroots is so important i love that thank you i wanted to ask you oh somebody was going to say something i was, was just gonna, yes, I was yes. just gonna, yeah i was just going to quickly jump in and say there's a website ballotpedia which is also a really great resource obviously your local news is a really great resource as well local paper um, most candidates will have some type of column or they will, you know, they'll be interviewed by the paper locally. So <clears throat> that's really important to, to, to get information about who they are um, as well. And those are reliable sources. You know, I don't want to leave, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't want to leave, um, you know, the information that you find about a candidate up to just a kind of a random Google, right? Like I think finding credible sources is also very, very important. And Ballotpedia is a, is a good initial source. And of course, your local paper, as I said. Mm -hmm. One other thing, let me ask you um, just very quickly around the table. I would love to hear about your issues that you feel are so important right now. Um, uh, you know, for me, I've been doing, we, we have a our cover story coming up for message features Congresswoman Lucy McBath. And you may remember her story because she was the mother of Jordan Davis, uh, the so-called loud music case years ago, um, lost her son to uh, a, a racial conflict. Racism was at the, the bedrock of that. And she decided to run for Congress after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting, in which 17 uh, youth lost their lives and 17 people were injured. Um, I think the story is so interesting because of the arc of her going from grieving and losing her only child from that all the way back up to representing her community to make sure she could do something about guns and gun violence. And we see today uh, the 
Urban League reports that uh, there are studies that show that this year alone, there are millions more guns being purchased and that there's a surge in gun violence and that surge in places where people are buying more guns also coincides with areas in where there is higher racial animus. And that's, that's, a, that's a very disturbing and scary kind of thought. And here this woman said, I'm a sacrifice, I'm a lay down my, what I'm doing to get in this fight and get in the battle and the struggle. What are your issues? What would you like to see done? Mm. Well, one of mine that I really feel will just kind of benefit us as a whole is violent crimes. Now, the irony is, is that violent crime in America on a whole has actually gone down about five or six percent um, over the last year or so. But murders have gone up by 16 percent. And the idea that we are seeing so much strife between our fellow man is something that I think we have to figure out how somebody's gonna come in and impact that particular dynamic because something is going wrong where people are deciding that you can just wake up and kill people at a clip of 16% more than what you did last year. Mm. You know, you're not even getting out and robbing people now. You're not even getting out and stealing. I mean, you're not getting out and doing all these other violent crimes, you're actually ending people's lives. And to me, so much of that has to do with who we are as a people, what we are trying to be, and also how do we help people to deal with mental health struggles that I believe are still a big part of even those numbers. And if we can figure out a way, in my opinion, to impact our world, to understand that mental health is serious and we need to do something about it, I believe that we'll just be a better place and a better group to want to be around each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up Representative McBath. I'm from Atlanta as well. And my family has known Representative McBath for many years. My mom sold her a house in Atlanta a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're kind of closely connected there. And I think what she represents is civic engagement, seeing something and doing something about what you see. And that's the issue that I'm really, really passionate about um, is for people to know, to be informed. Uh, so information and participation. I, I meet so many great people that I think, man, you have great ideas and so many of us agree on so many things. Why is it that our nation is crazy the way it is? You know, I think so many of us look around and like, I'm, I'm normal. This is something that Hassan Minhaj said. I'm normal, you're normal. What's going on with our government? It mm -hmm. doesn't make any sense. And I think the reason we're in the predicament that we're in is because we, we have so few people participating and making decisions. And so more participation, um, increasing our engagement with democracy, I think would be an amazing thing, which is of course why we started Impact mm -hmm. Democracy. It is for that exact and express purpose, information so that people know what's on the ballot, they know who the candidates are, they know the way they can be engaged and by engaging, making a difference. Mm. So one of the, th oh, go ahead, Mr. Everett. I just agree with them very quickly. Um, for me, it would be voting rights and, and access to the, to the voting booth because the voting suppression that's currently going on, I mean, it's so obvious and it's so blatant, which means it's so important to those who are trying to suppress it because they are afraid that what voting rights will actually give people um, they're afraid of that. So I would say that voting rights and, and to exercise those voting rights to be sure that, and I hope I'm not jumping ahead of you, but to be sure that you're registered to vote, to be sure that you know exactly in your particular neighborhood um, or community, how you can vote. How can I mail in? What do I have to do to get my mail in? Is it too late? When should I get it? How should I return it? Do I mail it? Do I take it to the precinct? Can I take it right to the commission? All of these things are so important and will determine um, the future of our communities because you know elections come about every two and every four years, mm -hmm. but they begin at the end of every election that has taken place. So on November 4th, we need to start preparing 
for the election of 2022 when our um, congressional representatives and in some cases our Senate representatives are up for re-election. Mm. This is, this is really, really good. Um, one of the things that I'm often thinking about as well, and I've seen this online, is many people struggle with the issue of, I voted, um, I saw that my vote reflected in the popular vote and my candidate is has won based on the popular vote, but then now my candidate has lost due to the electoral college. Can somebody explain what is the electoral college and 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 how can we kind of rebut the argument that well my vote doesn't really count clearly because i voted and my candidate lost due to the electoral college well i think um the electoral college was something that the founding fathers um, came up with as a concept to empower the ability for all states to have an impact. If we were simply going to be focusing on the largest numbers, what would happen in a campaign is people would only campaign in the areas that had the largest population centers. You wouldn't end up going to a lot of these other states, but you would feel that small to be impactful. And I think the purpose of the electoral college was really to create an environment where all states had an opportunity to really engage politically and you wouldn't be sidelined because you were a smaller state in comparison to a larger state. If, if popular vote was the way that you'd be elected, campaigns would look very different than what they look like right now. And the fact that you have places like New Hampshire and Iowa that people talk about, the popular um, you know, kind of campaign those states don't, don't even register. And so that was a big part of the process. And, and to be honest, the founding fathers actually had a lot of good concepts. When you think about it, and this is also how important leadership is, if George Washington decided he wanted to be king, he could have been. But because he decided not to be king, our wow. country is a very different place. You know, when leadership has the ability to step back when leadership has the ability to want to empower those who may not have the same amount of juice that I have, that to me is your first sign of greatness. So in my opinion, the Electoral College is, was to create an environment where we were not just simply going to be a confederation of states, but we were going to have a political system where we would really be the United States of America. And that's my understanding of how it works and why it's in play. No, that's that's great. I, you know, what I hear you saying is that uh, the founding fathers had something positive to give. Now, I have been noticing on my social media timelines that everyone is kind of becoming a bit of a, a, a far left abolitionist, right? In the sense that um, there is an argument that the entire country, the entire makeup, the foundation, the founding fathers, all of it is a hot, holy mess that needs to just be completely destroyed. And we have to start back up again. And it sounds like what you're saying is that, no, there are some systems and things that were put in place by some, and in fact, you just told me that slaveholder George Washington was a solid leader, right? There, there are some people out here that that I feel like would watch this and would say, man, Orlin, I can't even get to George Washington being a solid leader because I'm hung up on the fact he was a slave owner. Now I'm bringing this up, Saints, because I, I find that this is happening within our current leadership as well, right? So if we're looking at Biden and Harris, we are now seeing so many arguments against their appointment because you know Biden likes to sniff little girl's hair. Uh, he clearly likes giving massages and is just a very um, kind of that like your old creepy uncle um, that people. <laughs> so are, they say. <laughs> so they say he's a little uncomfortable on camera, and then. Kamala Harris, the sister who went on live DNC last night, gave the AKAs a shout out. 
uh, the Divine Nine HBCUs and her whole outro music was Mary J. Blige. Like that, like that chick is the same chick who, who, according to some people as a DA, literally put in policies that were against black people that have perpetuated police brutality and mass incarceration. So, so how do we as a country, how do we as voters navigate this space of having leadership that quite frankly is extremely problematic on, on, on many levels and rarely does things uh, that benefit black people as a whole. Uh, but instead we, we really only see that maybe this is a benefit to the country as a whole, but this hasn't touched black people. But how, how is this impacting black people? Why does it, come on, talk to me about this. Well, I'm gonna just do this briefly. And let me just, <laughs> all leadership is flawed. Hmm. All leadership is flawed at every level, at every organization, at every institution. Nobody's gonna show up with the perfect package or the complete package. So if we're looking for that, then we all need to stay home because hmm. that's not there. Secondarily, the importance of being a leader within a certain particular job you have to come with a certain set of gifts. You have to come with a certain set of abilities, but you also will come with a certain set of what I would call deficiencies. And part of the job of a great leader is to bring others in to help you with your deficiencies. George Washington clearly had problems in terms of what was going on in terms of slavery, but at the time that was a matter. That was what America stood for. When George Washington was elected president, only 6% of the population was allowed to vote. Mm -hmm. So he became president off of 6% of the population because if you weren't a landowner and you weren't a 25 year old white man, you couldn't vote. So the realities of who you end up with have much more to do with the pool of who gets to choose. So that's why I think it's so important what Garrison and Simone are talking about and also Deborah, we want the pool to be the type of pool that will make a choice that's more reflective of America. Mm -hmm. George Washington was reflective of America at that time. Mm -hmm. And what we want is in my opinion, an environment where the leaders are reflective of America. And guess what? Sometimes what America reflects, I don't like but that's also who we are. Mm -hmm. I want to get biblical, but I think the apostle Paul says the good that I thought I was going to do, I never do. And the evil I thought I would never do, that's what I do. <laughs> so that's how I kind of see it. Yeah, I would love to jump in there as well and introduce a, a word into our, into our conversation today. And it's anachronism. It's when we judge the past based on the present. And that is often the case with a lot of these, honestly, disinformation campaigns that are being levied against people like Senator Harris. Uh, when she was a, a DA, a prosecutor in California, the things that she was doing, they, they were progressive for the time. Uh, she's had a number of witnesses come forward. Uh, those who worked with her at the time and said that she was actually one of the most progressive prosecutors in the state at the time. But times have changed. And now we look back on that with, with, with skepticism. We look askance at some of the things that she did then because we're like, whoa, 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 we wouldn't do that today. But we have to be careful not to judge today, judge the past based on where we are today. The same thing applies in many ways with, with uh, former Senator uh, Joe Biden when he was uh, authoring the crime bill. At the time, he had large support within the black community for those, for those bills. There, there were people who thought, no, we need to crack down. There were those within our communities who said, no, we need to do something about this. And now we look back with, with clarity and we see how it played out. And we say, man, this was wrong. This was not right. It shouldn't have happened. And that's an appropriate response today. But we have to be careful not to judge the past based on where honestly God has brought us, mm -hmm. the way that God has progressed society and our understanding of one another. Today, we should not look back and judge people um, in, in a way that they were in the past. Think about the way that, that Dr. King says Negro and other leaders at the mm -hmm. time used words that today we will be offended at, mm -hmm. the, at the usage of those mm -hmm. terms. Um, but we recognize that times change, our understanding changes, and, and that's okay. That's a good thing. 
And can I add to that, that, you know, I'm glad we've gotten some of those mistakes out of the way. Um, we can learn from them, right? And, and as we look back, we say, oh, that, that was not the approach. And we've actually learned from the way that things have panned out, the way that certain systems actually affect communities, right? The crime bill, the way that over-policing Black communities led to over-arresting, led to over-criminalizing, led to mass incarceration. So, so we've seen how systems play out in our modern American world and um, society in a way that allows us to make more informed decisions. I also want to add in there that, you know, when we're looking at candidates, we have to take a fuller view of what they actually stand for. For example, um, Kamala Harris is against mandatory minimums um, on a federal level. That's a major um, policy decision law that really disparately affects um, black communities, right? Um, and she's against privatized prisons. That's another hot topic. There, she's against the death penalty. That's another issue. So, so there are a lot of things that are progressive about these candidates that we kind of, because we get hung up on, on a couple decisions that were made that we don't agree with, um, and understandably so that we are so passionate about those things, um, but, but looking forward, playing the long game, like we kind of talked about earlier, uh, we have to look at, okay, but have they learned from their, their mistakes? And, and are they willing to do things differently going forward? And if the answer is yes, then I think we have a system in which we can work and we can actually formulate um, things going forward. We, we would actually should be concerned if they didn't do anything during their time. That means they're not a mover and they're not a shaker and they don't care about change. They may have made the wrong decisions, but we have to look at their desire to, to make a change in communities, to see things turn around and say, okay, at least they're willing to move and to shake. Let's work on how, let's work on who's informing them. Let's work on getting people out there who have um, progressive and positive um, black community and, and, and other marginalized community facing policies so that we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Excellent. What you were gonna say something, Claudia? <laughs> oh, no, I thought I thought you had a question. I can always go. <laughs> no, no, no. I I definitely have a question. I think you know something that you hit on. And I know it's time for us to wind down, but what you hit on is something that Barack Obama said last night, or was kind of hinting toward, is that that cynicism is the death knell of what's going on. People who feel like there's no way to win, there, you know, my vote is not going to count. These candidates are not worthy. Um, the, the one thing that will kill our passion in our democracy is the idea that it's just not going to matter. And I see the flip side to that, um, um, the cynicism, I, I would also say is sort of, it, it could push back on me, especially you Christian folks. <laughs> it's sort of like a Christian nihilism in that we feel that this is going to end anyway. So bring it on don't engage or let this just happen the way it's going to happen, good, that's fine. I, I find that problematic, just as problematic as well, because then you're acting or you're not acting to help people as well. What do you think about that? I know we got to wind up after that. I'm sorry. Can I, can, I, can I share one quick story before we go and make two points in, if I can? Mm -hmm. um, when we think about what difference our voice, our vote makes. I want to recount to you a story, uh, something that happened in experience. In the 90s, when I was working in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to, as working in Philadelphia, so we had the opportunity to have an event called Sis, uh, the Sisterhood of Cities. And so we traveled, a delegation of us, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Philadelphia, Mississippi. We did that to commemorate the anniversary of the death of the three summer freedom writers. You'll remember them as um, Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. And as we um, landed, got off the plane, and just made our way to the site of where their bodies were found, which, and then we made our way to the home of Mr. Cheney's mom, James Cheney's mom, I had the opportunity to sit and talk with her. And she was transported back 30 years ago, all of the raw emotion, the hurt, the anger, the grief. 
came out in my conversation with her. She knew that her that that summer she knew and her son knew he was not going to make it through that summer. Mm. He knew that the work that he was doing along with the other freedom riders of the summer of 64, he knew they understood the depth of the importance of what they were doing. And they knew because it angered so many people, they were not gonna come out of it alive. Yet they were determined, they were still in their resolve to make sure that they did everything they could so that all of us would have the opportunity to vote no matter what we look like, no matter what our education. Um, and so when I hear people say, oh, my vote doesn't count, you know, when people say people die, that can be, you know, a, a, a statement that you can't put a face or a person to. But I was able to put my face and my person to James Cheney and his mom and understand the major sacrifice that not only he made, but that she made in him giving his life. So I would say to every young person, every old person, every person that is bothered by the system as we know it and think their vote doesn't count, yeah, it does, because somebody died for that vote. The other thing is, check out the state that you live in. So I know that there might be people tuning in from different states, but check out the state you live in. If you don't think your vote counts, when it comes to the electoral college, there are 29 states that require their elect um, their delegate uh, for the for the electoral college to vote the way the popular vote went. There are 21 states that don't. Make sure that you know whether or not your state will require that. So does your vote count? It certainly does, and it especially does if your electoral college representative comes from a state where they are forced to vote the popular vote. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is so good. You know, I really want to just kind of go around um, and just kind of share what are some practical resources, some practical means of engagement. Uh, Ms. Deborah has already kind of opened that door for us a little bit to, to really understand how our vote counts. Uh, Ms. Deborah, can you start off for us? What are some ways that maybe we can help others to help ensure that others' votes counts? Because, you know, as we um, really deal with this, there are some um, who are uh, handicapped or disabled. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we are in a pandemic, mm -hmm. right? We are going to be voting in a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we've never really done before. How can individuals who maybe have underlying health conditions and don't want to expose themselves to the elements, how can they cast their ballot safely? How can maybe we as millennials um, assist and help others and, you know, different things like that? You know, we can't necessarily set our churches to be polling places anymore, but let's maybe kind of talk just very briefly, you know, what are some practical things that we can do to help ensure the protection and the casting of others' votes? Such a good question. Do your research. Again, everything goes back to your research. So most people, a lot of people, a number of people are going to be voting um, by mail in, in ballot. Um, so re some research that I did here in um, Maryland suggests that you can, first of all, you have to request your ballot. It's not gonna come to you automatically like they did in the primary. So you've gotta request it. You've gotta request it early. It takes 30 to 45 days after you request it that they're gonna begin sending out those ballots. So look at your calendar, make sure you do it today. There's no reason not to do it today. If you decide to do that, make sure it is signed, make sure it is sealed and make sure it's delivered. How can you do that if you are handicapped or older, don't have the transportation? This is where I think our communities can come in. This mm. is where our churches can come in. We can volunteer to be one of those persons who will go and make sure that a senior or an you know, someone who is sick has their ballot, you can actually go to your election commission and pick up a ballot, take it to them, have them fill it out, sign it, make sure that it is signed, sealed. They can then give it back to you and you can take it right to a mailbox or a, a box where you can drop your ballot or hand deliver it to the commission, election commission, or take it to the precinct if you want and hand deliver it to the precinct. There is no challenge with chain of custody. As long as the ballot is signed, is sealed, anybody can deliver it to a place. 
So I think that as communities, churches garrison or 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 whatever kind of community organization we can come up with or individually, because I'm gonna do it individually. Um, I'm going to offer myself as one of those people who will deliver. So that's just one of the things I think that we can do. Excellent idea. Orlin? You know, I think it's important to just use your gifts to help people. Um, I think all of us need to understand that, you know, by the grace of God, we've all been blessed with a certain level of gifts. Deborah is talking about what she plans to do, because to be honest, that's within her giftedness. And don't worry about whether your giftedness actually replicates somebody else. No one should leave this call saying, wow, Deborah's going to do that. What kind of lazy dude am I? You know, no. <laughs> Find your thing that you can be impactful with and just do that. I mean, sometimes all you need to be the one who does is make telephone calls. To mm. me. Remind a friend of yours, today is the day. You know, remind somebody, request your your mail-in ballot today. You know, it doesn't take much to just try to be impactful. And you don't have to change the world. Right. If you change the attitude or the actions of one or two people that you don't touch, it's already a game changer. So that's my opinion for people. Just do what you do. Bloom where you're planted and don't worry about how you compare to other people. That's such a great segue. Uh, Simone and Garrison, talk to us a little bit about your thoughts and, and share with us about impact democracy. Yeah, so, um, you know, impact democracy, again, it, we exist to spark a movement of voter accountability partnership. That's why we started this. Honestly, it started because there was a time many, many years ago when I first met Simone, I didn't vote. I, I, I didn't think it mattered. I was the victim of a suppression campaign that told me my vote didn't count. It didn't really matter, right? And Simone was very, very instrumental in telling me, get your behind out there and vote. And I'm thankful for that. She held me accountable and it actually worked. And so we started Impact Democracy for that very purpose. You can follow us on Instagram or whatever, but, but more than anything, find two other people that you are going to connect with and say, we're voting together. And then encourage those two people to find two people. And think about how impactful that exponential, uh, how the impact of that kind of exponential connection um, will be for our democracy. And the second thing that I wanna say, we're launching this campaign uh, early next week, but we're trying to encourage young, healthy individuals to be election poll, poll workers. Um, obviously, if, if you've ever gone to vote, you know that the poll workers are normally retirees, people who have maybe a little bit more time, we're trying to get people to take the day off. I'm doing it, take the day off and go and work the polls. Here in Alexandria, you have to get there at 4.45 a.m., but they pay you $150. So it's worth your time, but more than anything, it's ensuring the integrity of your election. It's making mm -hmm. sure someone's there. It's making sure that this thing happens. That's the least that we can do for our communities um, so those two things, join us, impact democracy, but also find out how you can become a poll worker in your local county or city. Yeah, um, definitely follow us, you know, impact democracy on Instagram for more information, but I'll go ahead and share a couple of resources that we will be posting about later and just um, to try to help people. That's really the goal here. It's not about us. It really is about voting and being active in that mm -hmm. process. So vote.org is a great um, place where you can check your registration, you can get registered. Um, and there are even some, um, there's a hotline that the Lawyers Committee under law, um, they have a 1866 number, um, our vote, 1866 our vote. If you um, see any sort of uh, election meddling or, or suppression happening at your polls or anything like that. Also, I encourage you to vote early. It's easier. You have more places where you can go out to vote, less crowded. Um, you can pick your day. There's a little time span where you can do that. Um, and so that's a great way to combat, especially during this time. Um, you know, if you want to be there in person, definitely encourage you to take advantage of early voting this year. Um, and yeah, to, to do that. Ms. Deborah, I saw your hand. Final comments. You know, final comment. Um, I was, I did all the training to be um, a poll judge this year. Mm -hmm. I was excited about it. I took the training in February. Excited about it, because well, we all know I'm passionate about politics, right? <laughs> and then Corona. 
and they sent us all these text messages. Are you still willing to do it? And, you know, look at me. I, I fit some of those more, those issues that, you know, mm -hmm. so I said, no, no, I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. But in the last few weeks, I have been feeling so guilty. And so, so anyway, pray with me because I'm changing my mind about it. So just <laughs> over this person with her shield and her mask and everything. So Garrison, I am <sighs> gonna take you up on that. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I said millennial. I... <laughs> <laughs> Now you're young. We need Garrison to protect said, young, able-bodied, no, no sicknesses. No, Miss Deborah, don't get, don't catch nothing now. Okay. <laughs> oh, I okay. love it. All to okay. I mean, it takes six foot, you know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I love it. Right. You know what? And it, I, I was going to say um, that's one thing that just on the same note, this last note that that Michelle Obama said that really got me. She said, you know, pack your bag. Mm -hmm. And Beeper, if you're going to be one of those that's going to be standing in line, get the little stool that you can sit down on, bring your brown bag, bring your umbrella. I think not only just for the vote, but to let the world know, oh, I'm, I'll be here and I'll be taking this seriously. I love that. Man, this has been an amazing, amazing conversation. Thank you all so much just for your wisdom, your experiences, your knowledge, um, and your encouragement, your passion um, to allow all of us to not just simply watch the events of this week, but to understand them and to get activated and engaged. Uh, whoo, another awesome, epic conversation. I'm telling you, I love these. I love being here with you guys. I love having these conversations. They are so, so important. I know that you were encouraged and inspired, uh, even just re-watching that episode. I know I was. I absolutely loved hearing the things and the experiences um, that Garrison Hayes and Simone Hayes and Deborah Anderson and Mr. Orlin Johnson had and that they shared with us. So thank you so much for tuning in another week. Listen, okay, big announcement. We're gonna be back in the saddle again live next week. So you do not wanna miss it. Make sure you tune in next Thursday, uh, November the 5th right? Hold on. Yes. <laughs> Tune in November the 5th, 11 a.m. Thursday. Guess who the guest is going to be? Listen, my mother. <laughs> yes, you heard me. My mother, the Dr. Karen Allen. Um, who is the Dean of Nursing and Health Professions at Valparaiso University. She is going to be a guest on the show next week. And we are going to really get into how to break bad habits, how to break addiction. She has some mind blowing information that really explains why it's so difficult for us to break uh, these, these bad habits and why it's so difficult for people to stop engaging in their various addictions. And what is the kind of work that's necessary for you to get that kind of mental freedom. This is, I'm telling you, it is an episode you do not wanna miss. If you think that I'm funny, listen, my mom is gonna have you dying. If you think that I'm smart, listen, my mom is gonna blow your mind, okay? So you do not want to miss this episode. So make sure to tune in with us next Thursday, November 5th at 11 a.m. live. I am so, so excited to bring my mom to the podcast to introduce to to introduce her to so many of you. And quite frankly, some of you probably know her and you just didn't know she was my mom. So we're gonna have a, a great time together. I'm sure you're gonna be shocked. You're gonna be like, oh my goodness, that's her mom. Everything makes sense now. So I'm super excited to bring her to you, um, to introduce you to, to introduce her to some and reacquaint her with others. So I'll see you then. Of course, as I always say, follow us on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, at message 1898. Go to the website, 
www.messagemagazine.com. Get your print issue. What's the message doesn't happen without Message Magazine. So make sure that you are supporting Message Magazine as our leaders are currently in some intense, important conversations about further furthering that support for this magazine, for this ministry. We love you, we appreciate you, and we cannot wait to join you live next week, Thursday, November 5th. I'll see you then. I think the one other thing that we have to remember, our behavior is definitely influenced or impacted by, like, I'm, I'm a seventh day and we know that we decided that with the powers of Zoom and the like, uh, we can still um, uh, the eating of certain animals. Headline, I am your host, Claudia Allen. This is my chief executive, executive right? Um, so many churches are actually- 80% closed. of the affiliates, ABC affiliates here in the United States picked it up. I'm telling the truth and going back to let's just dip this water Some of up. The issues. And so we live our lives working. If you think about Brother most- Brother from another mother, the pastor, Richard Bird. And I'm telling you, you know, we handle the heavy stuff. We do the heavy stuff.